Kelvin Hepner with Real Agriculture. We are at FarmTech in Edmonton and joined by Steve Pratt of uh, the Canadian Canola Growers Association. Steve, talking about uh, grain transportation, of course, go back 2013-14 was uh, the year of the backlog here in Western Canada and we all remember what happened then. Since then we've had a, a change in federal government, we've seen some regulatory changes, talk about new legislation. How have, how have things changed, or, or do we have uh, a different situation now than what we had in 2013 14? Sure. Yeah, I'd say to that, uh, fundamentally, no. There's been, been some tweaking in that regulatory environment, as you talked about. Uh, we had the Bill C 30 uh, Act out of the 13 14 uh, time, and then we had that extended once, um, and then now we've had that change in government, as you mentioned, and we had a well, major thing there was the whole uh, the farm community and shippers um, interacting with the federal government's. Canada Transportation Act review panel, which um, gave their um, final report to the Minister of Transport in December of 2015. It was released publicly in February of 2016. And then with the new government, they sat on it for a bit to make their own approach to how they're going to deal with a report from that was commissioned by a, a previous government. And we saw the now new transport minister uh, engage in consultations over the course of the summer um, with all users of the transport system and then with grain and some farm leaders in Saskatoon in October and in November it all culminated with this Transportation 2030 which is the new vision of this this government and there's four things talked about in that vision statement and one was the ability for shippers to have arbitrated um, uh, arbitrated penalties into service level agreements second one was um, around definition of adequate and suitable within the uh, CTA and the third one was uh, around uh, um, a, a terminology used was addressing the maximum revenue entitlement and extended inner switching. Okay. Um, so that's where we're at and they committed to a spring rail bill, spring 2017, so we know there's work that's been done and we're just waiting to see the details now. Do you have any idea when that bill could be coming or, or what's... Well, what one would imagine with the legislative uh, calendar for the 2017 spring session, it's going to have to be in the next several weeks. And once that does happen and is um, uh, uh, dropped, uh, we'll see again that kind of uh, period of intense activity from all the, the farm groups, uh, consultation, going to committee and that type of thing. So. so introduction is one thing, getting it actually through the House of Commons right. and through and through Parliament is, is another thing, right? Yeah, and yeah. one would have to just uh, hopefully that this the uh, kind of issue attention cycle hasn't, you know, this particular issue that we've been talking about for a better part of a decade now yeah. as grain shippers, as, as farmers, as the green, as the shipping community that uses railways, um, ideally one would hope that can stay in that kind of order of precedence so we can actually uh, get this addressed. Okay, so it would need to be passed by sometime June or when does the... Uh, yeah, I believe it's June, June 22nd yeah. is the last scheduled day of sitting and one would imagine the changes would take effect for August 1, 2017, next crop year. Okay, so the language that we've heard so far, you mentioned addressing uh, the mm -hmm. maximum revenue entitlement, the, the revenue cap on grain transportation. Uh, what do you hope addressing means because that right now can mean yeah. almost anything. Right? Well, if you look back at what uh, some of the um, discussion in the Canada Transportation Act review report was talking about was this idea of modernizing the maximum revenue entitlement. So things like that inflationary factor that's common for both railways, calculating that separately so it's, it doesn't act as a disincentive to let's say a railway investment in hopper cars or something like that where if one moves in today's world, if one makes a significant investment in that rolling stock, the actual um, credit is split between both of them, whereas uh, the railways, and it makes sense from kind of conceptually that they would be able to be compensated fairly for the investments in the system that they make, and that would be the, the major one that's been talked about uh, by you know, by farm groups, by grain shippers, and by um, government and the uh, Emerson Report. What are some other things that? CCGA, the canola growers, will be looking for when we do see that legislation? Well, one thing that's a good for um, shippers of you know, canola and, and canola uh, oil and, and all canola products is that extended inner switching, which um, was studied by the House Committee in their C30 study, which was uh, came out uh, in December. And really, we see that as that kind of injection of, kind of pro-competitive um, uh, signals into that system where even if the use of it hasn't been um, major in the grand scheme of things, still that ability where shippers, um, you know, oil shippers and other shippers going into that southern corridor that have access to interchange with BNSF, they've even seen just a different kind of commercial relationship with their, uh, their primary rail service provider because of that backstop, if you will, of the extended inner switching. So that certainly is a, uh, one that um, CCGA and the 
the broader kind of grain community that works on this in collaborative efforts uh, would hope to see extended permanently. Okay, so the maximum revenue entitlement change and and interest switching are two of the big ones? Yeah, and then for the actual legal shippers is that ability to have reciprocal penalties yes. in a service level agreement, which the government in the C30 um, regulatory package and whatnot came close to that. But that would signal a major reform that we've, like that would, the ability for the great, like the WGA members or the COPA members or sh any shipper who wants to, not that they have to, but if they want to have reciprocal penalties in an agreement with their uh, primary rail service provider, that would be a reform, that would be a fundamental reform in the uh, commercial relationship between shippers and the railways. Okay. We have seen CN come out with this contract program that they say has some aspect of reciprocal sure. penalties built into it. What are your thoughts on the efforts by the railways to maybe mitigate some of the, what could be coming legislatively or, or to kind of be proactive about it? They seem to be putting some effort or sure. perceived effort into it. Well, in talking with the actual grain shippers, I mean, it is acknowledged that that is a move, you know, a move in that direction, but it's not where the um, actual shippers want to go. Okay. I mean, um, you know, the ability to kind of have a um, uh, kind of like almost like a back and forth tariff is one thing, but the ability to get, you know enter into a more comprehensive agreement where uh, it might be multi locations and some serious uh, on both sides some more serious um, uh, you know commercial terms that really strengthen that relationship is what the actual grain shippers would be looking towards. Okay. Yeah. Finally, then Steve, you mentioned the hopper car mm -hmm. fleet before. Uh, we keep hearing about the hopper car fleet has a, has a, in a limited time, uh, lifespan left. Where, where are we at right now in terms of who owns the hopper car sure. fleet and, and uh, its status? So in general, in Canada, we've got a um, situation that's very different in the United States because in Canada we had that public policy decision of government back in the 70s to get into the federal government and provincial governments in the 70s and 80s to get into the business of acquiring hopper cars and letting the railways use them for free. It was really to transition away from the box car to this new technology and also because that back in the back in those times it was a different environment, right? Uh, you had uh, statutory freight rates, the railways weren't making money in carrying grain, uh, they were starved for capital, one of the rails, railways was a crown corporation. Um, so. There's this acquisition of uh, between governments, uh, the federal government, government of Alberta, government of Saskatchewan, and the CW, former CWB. There's an acquisition of about 19,500 cars uh, that really underpinned that transformation of the system. So um, those cars all typically had about a 40-year economic life. And then when, um, in 2007, when there was an operating agreement made between the federal government and CNNCP, part of that agreement was a refurbishing to bring those cars up to a higher standard of weight adding an extra 10 years of life. So the cars have a maximum 50 years life, except the Alberta ones were never refurbished. They only have a 40 year life. So there's about 900 Alberta cars left. They're gonna actually not be able to run on the rails as of uh, 2022, 20, 23. And the majority of the rest of, uh, there's gonna be a huge swath of the federal government ones that come off in 2025, 27, with no federal or provincial cars left by about 2032, 2035, according to some, some modeling of that scenario. So. We're, um, it's certainly now, as we march forward, 2017, it's still out there several years down the road, but it is something that um, farmers, grain shippers, and their interaction with the railway and government need to be cognizant of because there's gonna be a need for replacement and uh, all the various uh, sources where that may come from. So Yeah, and everybody can probably point the finger at the other party and say, hey, you should be paying for this. So, yeah, so I mean, right. at about $100,000 a car, we're talking, if, if all those cars were to be replaced, we're talking about 1.4 billion. Um, so whereas, you know, there's limited sources of capital for that, and I think most people realize that it's, government's not going to be back in that game. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be shippers or the railways, or uh, there's a couple different kind of combinations there. But at the end of the day, from the farmer's perspective, as through the structure of the green industry, they're going to be paying for it some yeah. way, somehow. So it's really, what's that going to look like? And just to ensure that, I guess, A, we don't, come short on capacity there's, and you know there's cars out there cars can be built they can be obtained it's just that we all have a kind of a rational uh, discussion about it and um, just we kind of maintain that capacity moving forward are there cars out there that beyond beyond these government owned cars or, or sure yeah, yeah absolutely so much? Um, there is a, um, a mix a mix of cars the, the railways provide some shippers actually provide some so some of the, like mm -hmm. the, the uh, grain companies go out and lease their own small fleets and they use them with various programs of the railways like dedicated training program fleet integration and some of those commercial uh, agreements with the railways and those programs they have um, but 
Over the last 30 years, there's been a, uh, a very well-documented shift. The railways have got out of asset ownership, right? So it doesn't matter what sector you're in, what type of car you're using, they just don't want to be in the business of owning that. Um, so in the States, all grain shippers own their own lease or they obtain their own cars. Where in Canada, we've got that public policy decision from years ago the 70s, yeah. that we're now going to have, there's going to be a bit of a structural change as we kind of come down to more of a commercial okay. environment. It's just, who's going to, you know, it, it just, the CTA review report talked, they didn't make no recommendation on this issue, but they did mention that the government could play a role in kind of like an honest broker, strategic discussions with all the stakeholders, just so that there's some sort of level of comfort, I guess, at the end of the day to the farmers and to the rest of the world, that we can still supply what we grow in a timely and consistent fashion. All right. Well, we'll keep our eyes out, of course, for the new legislation that's supposed to come out yeah. this spring and pay attention to these details. Thanks for your insights, Steve. Hey, thanks for having me.